The important thing, ladies and gentlemen, is to understand that I'm a psychiatrist and I work in business and elite sport. And last Sunday, I was at home and I watched the most amazing sporting spectacle that I've seen for a long time. I was with my two boys, Arthur and Edward. They're 12 and 10. They didn't watch all of it. They were in and out. You know how kids are. But it was not only a great game, it was also an amazing example of how we start to understand performance under pressure. This was the game. It was the final of the World Cup T20 between England and the West Indies. Both teams had done remarkably well to get there. England had beaten New Zealand in the semi-final, who were tipped as the favourites. And the West Indies had dispatched with India, who were the host country, and they were fully expected to get there. So big expectation, big excitement. But before I tell you about that, let me just step to one side. In the work I do, I work with about 14 different team and individual sports in the UK. Cricket has an unusual feature. It's a team sport, but it's based around individual head-to-head -head combat. That probably explains, or is one of the reasons that explains, why the psychological attrition in cricketers compared to rugby players, football players, hockey players, other team sports is really high. It's got the highest suicide rate. We'll come back to why that might be. So back to the game. I was there with my boys in and out. England batted first and they got off to a shocking start. They lost three wickets quickly and it wasn't looking too good. But the reliant, resilient Joe Root came in, young star of England cricket, and he nudged away and he cajoled and he got the team up. And they eventually scored 155, which although not a fantastic score, is certainly a reliable inner final score, a good enough score to defend. Then it was the turn of the West Indies. Now, you may have seen in the press that a number of these players were coming up to retirement. So for them, it really was a big issue, an opportunity to go out on top. What the West Indies didn't know was that the strategists in England had been doing their homework. Instead of opening with our usual fast bowlers, Joe Root came on to bowl. And the strategy worked perfectly. In the first over, we took two wickets, including that of Gale who is the most destructive of batsmen. It was a really good start. England were on top. But it ebbs and flows. West Indies got back into it. Their cricket captain had a very, very good innings. They got up to about the 100 mark, and it wasn't looking so good for England. But then we took two quick wickets, and the pressure turned again. So the finale was set up. One over to go, 19 runs. I don't know how many of you know about cricket, but T20 cricket is fast and furious. You win it by scoring boundaries. 19 runs in six balls, though, is a big ask. It's nearly a boundary a ball. It was set up for this incredible finale. We had batting for the West Indies, Carlos Brathwaite, and bowling for England, Ben Stokes. It was a battle, really, between those two. Ben Stokes at this end, Carlos Brathwaite at this end. In comes Stokes. Stokes is a very combative, powerful, aggressive, tenacious player. Brathwaite, his focus was incredible. The first ball, he smashed it out of the ground into the stands for six. I looked at my boys and thought, not looking good, but I didn't say anything. I didn't want to let them down. I was then focused under pressure myself. The second delivery came and he absolutely clubbed this back over Stokes' head. He watched it go. And at that point, our heads went down as well. Bang, bang, two more deliveries, both for six. The game was over. The West Indies had won. And as the West Indies understandably, joyfully danced around that pitch, success in that last opportunity for most of them, the first team to be world champions twice, the other side of the coin, where there's a winner, there's a loser. The players gathered around the England bowler. Stokes was gutted. His world had fallen apart. The World Cup had gone. And that's the fine line between winning and losing. And even though the players were very supportive and what they were saying was, look, it's a team effort, it's a shared responsibility, in that moment, that made no difference to him. Is there anything that we can learn from this little vignette about performing under pressure? Well, as a psychologist and a psychiatrist, I would say absolutely yes. And it's this. If we think back to how Brathwaite was, his level of focus, his poise, that lack of psychomotor agitation showed me that he was absolutely in the zone. It's harder to make that assessment for a bowler because naturally he's moving, he's running, but certainly after the first delivery, there was a sense of body language change for Stokes. Brathwaite said himself when he was interviewed afterwards that when that over took place, it was like an out-of-body experience. What he meant by that was not some sort of spiritual happening. What he meant was that he was so focused, 
so in the zone, so in the present moment, we sometimes call that mindful, so mindful that he was able to totally focus on what he had to do, the perfect state to win that match. But let's take it away from elite sport and put it a little bit closer to our real lives. If I think about my first experience of this, I, growing up in West London, I was a fairly shy kid, and, but I was good at sport. I love sport, passion for sport, pretty good at rugby, as you've heard earlier. And that was really helpful because I got a lot of positive feedback from teammates, from family, from teachers. That helped me kind of overcome my shyness. It was good for my confidence, my self-esteem picked up. What that didn't do, though, was anything for my pre-match nerves. Here's a bunch of guys. We were 14, 15-year-olds at the time. And for the last few years, I'd been playing rugby. This is a county team. I would have really strong pre-match nerves. We call it anticipatory or performance anxiety. From about a day and a half before the game, I would be conscious of this sense of impending doom, sense of anxiety, worry. My focus was absolutely on this. It would affect my schoolwork. Physiologically, physically, what would happen? I would feel quite tense. I'd have a sense of my tummy being maybe overactive and sometimes get the odd cramp. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that this was a normal but slightly maladaptive physiological response, the fight, flight, the stress response that Keenan referred to earlier. So as I was getting older, I also noticed that this response, this discomfort, this unpleasantness went away as soon as the whistle blew and the game started. So something was changing. Something about my focus, something about my attention allowed me instantly to get out of this unpleasant fight or flight state. That didn't do anything about the pre-match anxiety, the anticipatory anxiety. What really helped me with that, and I'm not sure whether this is something I discovered myself or a sensible parent or a teacher pointed out, was to try and shift the focus of my thoughts. Instead of thinking about the forthcoming match, the advice was, think about positive previous experience. Visualize doing something good in the game. Project your thoughts forward to what it feels like after you've finished, after you've played, when you're with your teammates, win or lose, that shared endeavor, that sense of achievement working together, that kind of tired but enjoyable sense of having worked hard. Focus on that. And that worked really well. It would reduce, it wouldn't take away, but it would reduce the intensity of the anxiety that I felt. If we step it back even closer to everybody in this room, the number one feared activity, if you speak to people in our parts of the world, professionals, is public speaking. It's almost guaranteed to trigger that stress response. And in the short term, an acute stress response is a healthy, adaptive thing. It doesn't do us any harm. The problem arises when it becomes chronic or exposed to stress over a longer period of time. That's when we start to see health and performance impairments. So, in order to persuade the audience of this, in a moment I'm going to bring one of you up onto the stage. I'm going to get you to just do a little task, a little bit of a public speaking task. Some of you would know of the, pre the Radio 4 program, Just a Minute. So I'm going to give that lucky person one minute to talk about a topic I'll tell them without hesitation, deviation or repetition. But before I do that, just think about that. It could be one of you lucky people. Um, bear in mind that if we take an acute stress like that, actually, even though it's short term, think about me speaking today. I had the capacity to be worried and stressed about this talk from a few months ago when I was engaged. I've got the capacity to be worried about it now. And actually, if I don't do a good job, I can go away and I can take that with me. So as humans, we've got this ability to lock up stress and take it with us wherever we go. And that's the maladaptive bit. So the person who's about to come up, and actually everybody on that side can relax because I'm going to choose from this side. So just ease back. The person that's going to come up likewise is probably worried a little bit now. When they come up, they may be even more worried. I'd expect their stress response to tick up. We can check with my heart rate monitor. And afterwards, if they feel embarrassed about what's happened in front of someone they know, then they've got the possibility to carry that on with them. So there's this gentleman here with glasses. And you'll be very pleased to know, sir, you can stay right where you are. <laughs> and probably, as I was going through that little build-up, some of you would have been a little bit anxious that you might have been chosen. And when I pointed at you, I imagine that you started to feel a little bit anxious, sir. So let's not focus on you. Let's focus on me. My personal experience of public speaking I was this shy kid. Sport helped me, but I wasn't one of these kind of extroverts that like to get up on stage and be in the end of year show. Um, but in my last year at school, <coughs> I was called into the headmaster's office uh, just before the end of the previous year, I should say. And the headmaster said, Hopley, 
he said, um, congratulations. He said, we're going to make you head boy next year. And I was, I have to admit, I was delighted, but I was also surprised. But he said, Hoppy, don't get carried away. He said, you, like I, and all the teachers know, it's not a particularly strong year. There weren't that many competitors for the job. <laughs> so uh, some benefits come with that. Uh, a silly uniform, didn't like that. But also the need to get up onto the stage every morning at assembly and quieten down the mass of 300 people before the headmaster came up to start morning prayers. Now, <laughs> the young kids, you know how it is, young kids at the front, and they go back as such, and you've got the upper six, my mates, right at the back, underneath the eaves, you know what they're up to. I had no ability to fast forward into a positive experience of this. The coping strategy I had for rugby didn't exist. This was my very first time. So how do you, how do you manage this when it's your first time? Well, one of the things you do is you try to anticipate how things are going to be. You think to yourself, this will happen, so I can expect it. That will happen, so I can expect it. That can happen, so I can expect it. And up I came. And I was nervous as hell, absolutely nervous as hell. And I got the things you would expect. I got the odd sort of grimace. I got the odd sort of bit of rustling and tussling going where I had to say, calm down, boys, keep it nice and easy. I got the odd name called out. I got the odd reverse one of those, if you understand what I mean from the back. But what I wasn't banking on, what I wasn't banking on, and what really threw me was the sheep noises. <laughs> a boy in the lower six over in that corner, I forget his name, actually it was Kevin Dutton, that was it, D Dutton and Mutton is what stuck in my mind, and he just started going very quietly, because the teacher over here, bah, bah, bah. Now, how, how, anyway, the lovely thing was, the humour helped me to get through it, which was positive. So let's go on to look in more detail at why these things occur, because short-term stress is fine, longer-term stress is not so good. Psychologists understand that we all react very differently under certain circumstances. There are some people who would have done that job as head boy and loved it. They'd have been up there and they'd have been cavorting around. But why is that? Let's take a common scenario. Two people on a tube going to work, train gets jammed, no announcement. Person number one, very calmly, opens his bag, takes out his laptop, starts doing some work, thinks, might as well use my time, nothing I can do about it. Person number two sits there feeling quite tense, becoming increasingly irritable, saying to themselves, this is disgusting. I pay all this money for my season ticket. These people should be able to get me to work on time. Not only that, if I'm late for the meeting, it might cause the wrong impression. That might affect the contract. I'll then be badly appraised. So he starts to catastrophize. Psychologists have a theory. We like simple theories, the ABC. So in this situation, you've got the activating event, something happens, and it leads to consequences. There will always be physiological, emotional, and behavioral. The first two you can recognize, the behaviors are important. Because in the workplace, sometimes we see people's irritability spilling over, they're a bit short, their communication isn't great. I imagine all of you at some point have sent an email and then later said, why didn't I stop and think about that before I sent it? So behavior gets affected. But of course, A doesn't cause C because we've got the same activating event, two different sets of reactions. What's happening is that this is all going through a prism, our beliefs or our perceptions. So the gentleman that was very calm and relaxed, his belief set is that there's no nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to be able to make a claim that's going to make any difference to my life. The other gentleman, on the other hand, is thinking, this is disgraceful and it's going to really affect me. So gentleman number one reduces the level of his stress response. His consequences are much more pro-health. And gentleman number two goes the other way. And of course, the downside of that is the impact that's going to have on our performance short term, on our health long term. We're trying to avoid carrying stress around with us. These are not new ideas. The ancient Greeks knew about it. But we haven't yet really assimilated all this. We don't use it in our day-to-day -day lives in the way that we should be able to. Let's just show you an example. Perceptions are so variable. Five seconds, show you the dress. What color is it? OK, could you tell me what color you see, sir? Hands up if you see blue or blue and black. Turn around, have a look. It's about two thirds of the audience. Hands down. Anyone see a different color? What do you see, sir? White and gold. OK, hands up for white and gold. About 10%. So the interesting thing is, this was very controversial at the time, recent fMRI studies at the Institute of Psychiatry show that those of you like me that see the white and gold 
on average have better attentional abilities and a 5 to 10 mark higher IQ. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Now, all this is showing we see things differently. And the fact that we see things differently means we often think and perceive things differently. That visual image is a metaphor for our thoughts. Let me take you through the common mind traps that we try and encourage people to step away from. Catastrophizing. Talked about it before. Fast forwarding to the worst case possible scenario. Appraisal, one area is bad. Reads it. The catastrophizer goes, oh my God, it's going to be a terrible appraisal, not going to get the bonus. They're going to be watching out for me at work. I might not be in the team for the next big pitch. That means I might lose my job. If I lose my job, the mortgage is gone and my wife might leave me. <laughs> okay, it's not going to happen, but some people start to go that way. Here's another set. I live by the rule of should. I grew up in a Catholic family, went to a Catholic school. My uncle was the parish priest. No pressure there. I then made head boy. I was senior cadet in the CCF. It's all about rigor, rule, routine, doing things properly. So my default is I should do this, you should do that, you should write that report that way. It's the rule of should. And all of these mind traps are amenable to change, but they become problematic when we get stuck with them. And here's what we do to change. Check your thoughts, challenge them and change them. Look for evidence, look for support for why you think some way, why you think that's happening now, why is it happening to me? Most of us find it difficult. We're not good at questioning ourselves. So try this technique. Try instead of saying it's yourself, imagine, particular scenario is something that you are advising a friend on. Depersonalize it. It makes it a lot easier to approach it. But before I finish, there's always a catch because this stuff's been around since the ancient Greeks, but we're not that good at it. And why is that? This is why. But if we want to, we certainly can. So if you get out there, you tackle your mind traps, and you're minded to try and think things differently, the impact of stress on you will change, and I'd expect you to see improvements in your health and your performance. Thank you.